All of the defendants are charged in count one of the indictment with the commission of war crimes and crimes against humanity in connection with the planning and execution of the Nazi slave labor program. This program, designed to enable the Nazi war machine to continue its aggressions, involves the criminal exploitation of every possible source of manpower. Millions of non-combatants from the countries overrun by the Wehrmacht were uprooted from their homes, packed like cattle into transports headed for Germany, and there compelled to work under appalling conditions in mines, foundries, steel mills, and armament plants under the direction of men like these defendants. Prisoners of war provided another source of supply. With the usual Nazi disregard of international obligations, they were put to work in the manufacture of armaments in direct violation of the laws of war. And as the manpower situation became even more critical, there was made available to the leaders of German industry that most unfortunate group of all the victims of Nazi tyranny, the concentration camp inmates. The relevant provisions of Control Council Law No. 10 are clear. Deportation to slave labor is enumerated as a war crime in Article 2, Section 1B. Enslavement and deportation are made crimes against humanity in Article 2, Section 1A. Article 52 of the Hague Convention as to the use of labor in occupied territories and the provisions of the Geneva Convention as to the employment of prisoners of war had, long before the enactment of Law 10, established principles of international law which condemned such practices. Indeed, an attempt by Germany in World War I to deport labor forcibly from Belgium met such an outcry of world opinion that the plan was attacked, even in the Reichstag, and subsequently abandoned. But the evil in this program lay not so much in the fact that it violated the letter and spirit of international law as in the utterly barbarous way in which it was carried out. The revolting details were presented in full to the International Military Tribunal and need only be touched on here. Fritz Salpel, Hitler's labor plenipotentiary, estimated that five million foreign workers were transported to the right and that only 200,000 came voluntarily. The rest of them were corralled in manhunts in which houses were burned down, churches and theaters searched, children were shot, and families torn apart by the SS and other recruiters. From then on, the victims were subjected to all the tortures, indignities, and sufferings that the human mind can encompass. The basic philosophy of their treatment is illustrated by Southwell's instructions of 20 April 1942 that all the men must be fed, sheltered, and treated in such a way as to exploit them to the highest possible extent at the lowest conceivable degree of expenditure. And by Himmler's notorious declaration, in a speech made at Posen on 4 October 1943, whether 10,000 Russian females fall down from exhaustion while digging an anti-tank ditch interests me only insofar as the anti-tank ditch for Germany is finished. We must realize that we have six to seven million foreigners in Germany. There are none of them dangerous, so long as we take severe measures at the merest trifles. Where then lies the responsibility of these defendants for the murders, tortures, brutalities, and cruelties committed in the execution of this program of wholesale crime? In the first place, they used, in the enterprises under their control, tens of thousands of impressed foreign workers and concentration camp inmates. The mere utilization of this labor constitutes the crime of enslavement, a crime of which all the defendants are guilty as principals. Flick, with his co-defendants Burkhardt, Kalich, and Weiss, controlled the Flick and Zarin. And together, they share the responsibility for the widespread use of slave labor throughout its enterprises. Tarbagger is guilty because of the utilization of slave labor at Max Hughes, where he was the principal management official. Steinbrink, in his capacity as plenipotentiary for steel and for coal in parts of the Western occupied territories, 
made extensive use of slave labor. In the second place, these defendants, by their voluntary participation in this program, with full knowledge of the criminal methods used in the recruitment of forced labor, are guilty of the crime of deportation and of the murders, brutalities, and cruelties committed in connection with such recruitment and deportation. The evidence will show that the defendants knew well <coughs> the manner in which this labor was being recruited. In fact, they made every effort to participate in it directly by sending their own representatives to the occupied territory. As to the voluntary nature of their participation, it need only be pointed out that no employer in the Third Reich was assigned labor against his will. He had not only to ask for the allocation of labor, but his success in getting it depended on the pressure he could bring to bear on the allocating authority. The enterprises under the control of these defendants were eager, aggressive, and successful in their efforts to obtain workers from all sources involved in this criminal program. The individual firms besieged their local labor offices. The Berlin office of the concern was in constant touch with various officials of the ministry connected with the administration of the program. Finally, pressure was brought to bear directly on Sauper, Speer, and others at the top of the Nazi hierarchy by means of the powerful self-administrative associations of industrialists, such as the Reichsvereinigung and Eisen, RVE, for the iron industry, and the Reichsvereinigung Kohle, RVK, for the coal industry. To all principles for the deaths, inhumane treatment, and suffering of the workers while employed in enterprises under their control. The entrepreneur was responsible for the well-being of workers on the job. True, he was circumscri circumscribed by government regulations as to the amount of pay, the food ration available, and in certain other details. But the primary responsibility for the health and well-being of these unfortunate workers belong to the owners and managers of enterprises. We shall have occasion to see how these defendants discharge that responsibility. We turn now to a discussion of the evidence to be, to be presented on this count. Reports from both Hartman and Astin show that by 1944, over half of the entire labor force came from foreign sources. These same statistics, in many instances, carry separate columns indicating the number of prisoners who are employed. A comparison of the statistics with reports prepared in the Flick Front Office from 1942 to 1944, showing the contribution of the Flick concern to the war effort, proves conclusively that prisoners of war were used in the manufacture of armaments. For example, shell casings were made at groups, ammunition at Freital, and armored cars at the Linka Hoffman Works. During this period, the employment statistics show that in January 1944, 1,145 prisoners of war were employed at Curtis. In December 1943, 671 were employed at Freital, and in July 1943, 1,017 were employed at Linka Hoffman. The concern and its Berlin office from the outset was eagerly interested in taking advantage of all sources of the new labor supply. Scarcely a month, scarcely a month and a half after the invasion of Poland, prisoners of war were arriving for work at Macuta. Whenever an additional source was made available, the Berlin office was careful to inform the various companies what steps were necessary to get their share of the new laborers. We find Kutner, Burkhardt's assistant in Berlin, conferring with officials of the labor ministry in June 1942 concerning the acquisition of Russian and French laborers. 